Hi everyone and welcome back to my top 50 board games of all time. Uh, in this video I'm going to be counting down from number 30 to number 21. So uh, let's get started. So at number 30 I have Firenze by um, Andrea Stedding. Now this game was very much a, um, a grail game for a number of years and I think about two or three years ago they brought this game out again, much to my um, delight. Um, and it's been a strong favourite ever since. This one has a real classic feel to it. Um, I suppose it's a, it's a tower building game and you are going to be collecting bricks to build these different towers and then commissioning them to get points. Um, and basically only one player can commission each tower of a certain height. And there's not only one type of brick in this one, there's all different kind of qualities of bricks. Um, you know, the white ones are very common and the, I think it's the purple ones are extremely rare. And the, the reason that you are building those towers is not only to get points immediately, you also get points at the end of the game, um, depending on who's built the most of a certain colour, um, kind of on an area majority uh, method. But also the, the most interesting thing about this game is the way you actually accumulate the bricks, because there is this row of cards, um, and in each of those cards not only has like a, an ability assigned to them, but also has um, a number of bricks placed on them um, as they come out. And on each player's turn, they can either choose to take either the, the one furthest to the left and not pay anything, but they can take any action card they want by paying an additional brick and placing them on each card on the way. So the ones that aren't so lucrative um, build and accumulate different types of bricks, making the incentive bigger and bigger um, for future players. And that's actually one of my favourite mechanisms in board gaming. And I think Firenze does that better than almost any game out there. So I really do like that. And in addition to that, all those action cards are, are really interesting because they can do uh, extremely powerful things to help you kind of increase your capacity or help you build things faster. But they can also do very nasty things such as making you, you know, smash towers down or making you lose points. So even though there's some horrific and horrendous cards um, out there, and they'll end up accumulating so many resources that eventually, eventually you're going to bite the bullet and actually take that negative card. So I really do love that. Um, there's also this kind of ongoing pressure on the game because if you don't increase your towers um, from round to round, they actually um, kind of destroy themselves. So there's this kind of pushy like element where you have to weigh up your options whether you're going to buy or cash in when your towers are a bit shorter or wait until they're very tall to get a whole bunch of points but obviously risk them um, falling down in the process. But a great game, one that I'd highly recommend, that is Firenze. And uh, that one was actually number 26 last year, so extremely slight fall for that one. Uh, next up at number 29 I have a new entry and the newest game, actually the most recent game I've played um, on this list, this is Paris. Now this is the latest game from um, Wolfgang Kramer. Uh, this one is, oh, and Michael Kiesling as well. And I've, if you've listened to my other videos, um, I think this is the third game of theirs um, on this list so far. This one is a lovely game. Um, not only by the way it looks and the production stuff, I suppose in its essence it's a, another area control game um, with this huge map of Paris and these different regions in them. And you are basically um, playing keys onto these different sections, getting money in return. But then with those keys, you are climbing up these different buildings, um, paying money to do so, um, in order to get the most influence in those regions and score majorities at the end of the game. But the, the cool thing about this game is that a lot of those different regions actually um, offer you the chance to go around this time track and pick up all these bonus tiles, which, which can give you lots of bonuses, such as you know additional money or additional keys or points for doing certain things. Um, and I really do like the time track in this game. I think it's very well executed. And all in all, I think it's just a, a wonderfully put together Euro game with extremely um, boiled down mechanisms, very easy to explain. Um, and it's just another great design by Kramer and Kiesling. And the way that they keep bringing games out um, that are fresh, um, innovative, but still, um, you know, streamlined and simple and pure. It's just, they're just brilliant designers. And this is just another example of that. And um, I really did enjoy this one more than I thought I would. Uh, next up at number 28, which was last year's number 32. So a slight increase for Ra. Now, Ra is one of Reiner Knizia's um, iconic auction games. This one is more of a push your luck um, game, as you are placing tiles out onto the board, um, which, all off, which offer you lots of different ways to score. 
Uh, but you've got to be careful about um, bringing these rad tiles out because you can end up going bust and um, not getting anything. But at the same time, those rad tiles trigger auctions um, and players can obviously get uh, get a chance to bid on, on that lot of tiles. But the, the cool thing about this game is you have a, um, a set um, set bids you can you can use to actually accumulate this tile. So you might have, um, I think you have four tiles and they could be like a, a number, um, you know, another 10, a number 11, a number four, a number three. And you can actually use those to um, to get those tiles. But when you, when you use them, you get the one that was bid last time um, back into your kitty for the future round. So you can wager your bets quite cleverly um, in order to set yourself up in the future. Um, a game of small gains. Um, I think there's a lot of minutia that goes into being a good player of Ra. And, um, but at the same time, there is quite a lot of luck that goes into it as well. But I think this is such a fun game. It's a really satisfying game to play in about half an hour to 45 minutes. And um, I've got this one to the table very frequently because it is that much fun. And this one it goes back, I think, again, another 20 years or so. So it um, holds up extremely well today. And that's just a, a testament to a great design by a great designer like Randy Knizia. Uh, next up at number 27, I have a new entry, and this is a bit of a placeholder entry really for Tekenyu, Obelisk of the Sun. Now this is a 2020 um, release game by um, Daniel Tashini and David Terzi, who are two great designers and two of my favorites. Um, this one is um, at number 27 because I've actually not had much opportunity to play this one, um, not as much as I'd like to anyway, and I think there is a lot of potential for this one to go higher on my list. This one is a dice drafter, um, another quite a heavy euro. Um, but the the method of drafting the dice are quite is quite interesting. This one because you have this obelisk in the centre of the table, and that obelisk dictates whether the the dice are in the light, in the shadow, or in the darkness. And that can um, change the potency of the strength of those dice, and even choose if you can um, take them or not. And at all times, you've got to um, weigh up this. Um, almost tension of balancing your scales as much as possible because you want you want light dice and dark dice um, or tainted and pure dice I think it's called um, on your scales and if you balance them as much as you can then you can um, you, you know you don't have to suffer negative points and on top of that I think it's more of a, a game where there's lots of mini games you know such as accumulating cards um, there's area control um, and lots of things like that and you know you can build a bit of an engine as well throughout the game um, I really really did like this one I think it was uh, a game that will re reward more plays, hence why I think it's going to stand up, um, you know, or go higher in the list going forward. Um, but, you know, Tashini brings out lots of these um, dice-driven Euro games, and he just seems to be the best in the business at doing that. And uh, Dekenyu is a great example of that. So number uh, 27 is Dekenyu. Uh, at number 26, I have another Stefan Feld game with In the Year of the Dragon. Now, interestingly enough, this one was number 54 last year. So uh, this one is obviously a game that's grown on me. And, you know, the more I play it, the more I enjoy it. I think it is such a fun game and extremely out there for a Stefan Feld game because obviously he's known for his point salad games where you get points for doing everything and ev you know, anything and everything. This one is really a game of attrition where you are c constantly bombarded with all these different... Um, you know, diseases and um, taxes and all these horrible things that are just going to be obstacles to overcome. And it really is a game about weathering the storm. And at the end of the game, who's kind of weathered the storm the best is going to be the winner. As you utilise these different workers and, um, you know, line up your buildings, you've got to feed your workers and stop them being, you know, stop them from getting diseases. Um, it's just so good. And it is a game where you come out the other end just feeling like you've, um, you know, walked 100 miles because it is... Um, it's quite a nasty game. It's very punishing, um, but I just love the way it comes together. It has this really cool um, action selection method where um, the different actions are allocated into different sections, and basically there is a, a turn order track. So being first, um, being first in player order is so important because you get first dibs on the tiles you want. Because if you go after or go to the same section as another player has before you, you're going to have to pay money. And money is an extremely tight resource in this game, not only for taking the actions you want, but also for paying your taxes. So yeah, this one is so good. And if you, if you like your foul games, but want something 
a bit different um, from his traditional kind of you know tropes then in the year of the dragon is definitely one to check out um, at number 25, I have last year's number 7. This is The Resistance Avalon. Now, this is by far my favourite social deduction game. Um, you know, a game where you get two teams. One person, one team's the secret bad guys, one team are the good guys, and the bad guys have to kind of uh, intercept and create chaos and hopefully make the team lose the um, overall mission. But this one is my favourite, not only because it's so pure, but I love the, um, the nuances about how all the different roles interact with each other. Um, they just, it just comes together in such a clever and neat and smart, tight way that the, the level of social deduction is just increased to huge levels. Um, you know, the smallest of tales can give away whether you're a good guy or a bad guy. Um, I understand that a lot of people don't like social deduction games because they don't like being put on the spot and having to lie. Um, but this one is, is, so, is so great because all the roles are extremely interesting. For example, you've got the Merlin role, who's a good guy, but he knows who all the bad guys are. But he's got to be careful about who, he, you know, uh, kind of relaying that information to his team. Because at the end of the game, if the bad guys know who Merlin is, then they are instantly going to win. So, yeah, this one is a great game, a classic, again, and um, I'm sure a lot of you have played it, but still, um, you know, a, a tried and tested favourite for me, and um, it will never go anywhere in my collection, because I love it. Um, at number 24, I have a very small um, fall, which was last year's number 21, for Awkward Guests. Uh, Awkward Guests is, um, I said, by far my favourite um, deduction game. Um, this one is leagues above anything else out there, in my opinion. Um, it's, it's, I said, it's, it's a pretty traditional um, deduction game as you're trying to solve a murder mystery by, you know, deducing who the murderer is, who the, you know, what weapon they've used, what their motive is. But this one is great because you have a blueprint of a mansion and you're trying to um, work out the kind of entrance and exits they've taken to, you know, which will give you information based on what weapons they could have used and stuff like that. But the, the way this is all driven is so clever because it's driven by a, um, a deck system and where all these different cards are shuffled together um, in order to form that story. And the, the variability and the replayability is huge because there are thousands of cases you can play um, and it's just constantly engaging, always um, you know, loads of red herrings and stuff like that. The, the way the information is traded amongst the players is interesting because you... You can actually trade um, information with each other, but having to give you know, equal amounts to each other, or you can deliberately hide pertinent information from each other as well. And it is just absolutely a delight to play and um, just constantly fun. That is Awkward Guests. Um, at number 23, I have uh, another new entry with Signorie. Now, this one is the first um, What's Your Game um, game or title I've played. And, um, it's is, it is really um, impressed me. It's another dice drafter game, but this one you are drafting dice um, to give you discounts on paying money for things. So, for example, you know you could um, take a certain um, action which will cost you, um, say, five coins. But if you if you took the um, five dice, then you have to pay nothing. But at the same time, you have to be careful about how many high dice or high value dice you're taking because if you go over a certain threshold then you miss out on certain bonuses. Um, and it's a game about kind of marrying your daughters off the, um, to um, powerful families, about um, increasing your son's influence in these different kind of um, disciplines, such as, you know, um, religious track. There's a um, kind of a military track, and you're going to get points for doing so. But it's all those tried and tested Euro mechanisms put together in such a great way. And one of my favourite things about this game is the investment in taking... Um, uh, in building your engine because you can piggyback um, or, or uh, kind of increase your engine by investing in these things that when you take certain valued, valued or colored dice then you get a whole bunch of kind of um, trailing mechanisms which can kind of give you loads of mileage um, out of your actions and I really do like that all the investments or upgrades are, are really lucrative and can get a lot of um, you know, you can get a real edge on your opponent if you if you utilise them to the maximum. And yeah, it's just a fantastic game, um, and I really was impressed by it. That is Signorie. Um, at number twenty-two, I have last year's number thirteen, 
with Orlean. Uh, Orlean is a, um, I suppose it's the famous um, bag building game as you are accumulating these different um, tokens into your bag, drawing them out to take different actions. I suppose it, it, it's very much like a deck builder, but instead of drawing cards, you're drawing these tokens and placing them onto your board in like a worker placement method. And then you are triggering, the, triggering those actions in any order you want. And you can kind of increase your um, engine as you go on, as you can get more and more tokens out of your bag. You can um, go up lots of different tracks to increase your multipliers for endgame scoring. You're traveling around the map of France trying to get different resources. Um, you can get your own buildings, um, which can give you really powerful benefits that your opponents can't have. Um, but one thing I'd highly recommend with this game is to get the Trade, trade and Intrigue expansion. Because with that game, this goes from about you know uh, you know a seven and a half to about um, an eight and a half or a nine out of ten because it is so so well put together. There's this tension about whether you uh, you know having a powerful bag, but when knowing when to start shedding those tiles um, to get bonuses on a separate board, it really does have everything. This game and um, it's just a delight to play, and um, I've got this to the table quite a lot over the years, and still not even slightly tired of it. That is Orlean by um, Reiner Stockhausen. And finally, for this list, um, at number 21, I have, I suppose it's a new entry, um, but its sister game is was on my previous lists. This is um, Marco Polo 2 in the service of the Khan. Now, obviously, Marco Polo, um, uh, Marco Polo, or the Voyages of Marco Polo, which was the original version of this, was an extremely popular um, Euro game. Um, it's a dice placement game, as you are... Um, collecting resources, fulfilling contracts, um, traveling around a map of Asia. Um, this one still has all those things, except it has lots of slight improvements, at least for me, um, that I really enjoy. Um, for example, in the original, you would have to, um, you know, you'd really, I find you'd almost neglect the traveling part more than the contract part. But this one, those two elements of the game are a lot more synergized, where you have to travel in order to get the contracts in the first place. This one has a set collection method as you're trying to kind of get your um, get your trade houses or trade posts in all the different cities. Um, it has it still has the amazing um, character powers or unique player powers that you would get in the original, but in this one I think they are a bit more balanced, a bit more controlled, uh, controlled. and um, I, I just love everything about this game. It's slightly more open. Um, but I really do like that, and I, I, it's such a smooth and simple game um, that just works so, so well, and very easy to teach, actually. And in addition to all those things, there is um, a bit more of a dynamic board state, because the market in the game where you accumulate your resources actually changes from round to round, um, which makes things a bit more interesting for me. And there's also additional resources, such as Jade, which can get you more um, lucrative rewards for doing certain actions. So really do like this one and um, it's a bit of a classic and yeah the second version just um, just increases on the first one for me but still both excellent games so that concludes um, this portion of my um, of my top 50 board games of all time I hope you've enjoyed it um, I hope you keep joining me as I count down my top 20 so um, if you have enjoyed the video please hit like and subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos too for everyone else I'll see you next time on chairman of the board bye